I am Francesc Moreno Noguer. I am a research scientist at the Institute de Robotica. And uh, today I'm going to present the work that we've been doing in the last uh, four or five years in our group uh, about uh, human modeling, um, basically using deep learning and uh, in most of the works that I'll be presenting using single images. So what we want to do is to capture different aspects of the human body from, from a single image. For instance, as uh, Greg uh, has been already talked in the, in the, uh, previously, uh, we also wanted to tackle the problem of uh, human body pose estimation, that is estimating the 3D position of the, of the body joints uh, from single images. We've been working also on uh, reconstructing clothing and uh, the shape of the body. First, in the first work, what we did uh, uh, work on uh, reconstructing the precise geometry of a small patches of clothes or the formable objects in general. Then we extended this to the reconstruction of the whole body and also the clothes that, this, uh, that the people were wearing. And uh, more recently, uh, we also presented a generative model. That is a model that is able to create new clothes, right? To learn how uh, the distribution of uh, clothes, the geometry of the clothes uh, uh, is. And uh, from this uh, large distribution, we can generate new clothes and fit these clothes on images. Uh, in this work, we are moving in the 3D level, but we also have been working on 2D representations. So uh, we also did work on person image synthesis so that given a single image of a person from a specific viewpoint, we wanted to uh, generate new images of the same person seen from different viewpoints, right? And we also did this for faces uh, and in the specific problem of uh, animating faces, right? These two works on the, are on the realm of 2D, but then we moved uh, also to the 3D on uh, reconstructing 3D faces and 3D heads in general from, uh, in that case, one, two, or three images. And finally, I'll present also work that uh, Gregory mentioned it very briefly because that's work that we did in collaboration with Greg while one of our, my students was uh, uh, an internship at Naber on graphs of affordance. So this means that even an image of a, a scene, we want to uh, synthesize, uh, hallucinate uh, the possible hand configurations to grasp each one of the objects of the scene. All right, so that's a brief summary of uh, what I'm going to talk. So since our different topics, uh, I, uh, if you want to interrupt you, uh, interrupt me at any moment or ask uh, anything uh, after each topic, so uh, that's completely fine. So for all these works, uh, we could uh, use a brute force uh, solution. So now everybody's using deep learning. So we could take uh, our favorite uh, deep network. Uh, we could set up the hyper parameters the structure of the network and train it uh, with uh, as much data as we have and then cross fingers. And if everything works, uh, that's fine. If not, we go to a step number one and we, uh, we repeat with a different network. We change the, the, the data configuration, some of the layers, some hyper parameters, etc. But instead, the, the, the common denominator of our work is that we try to design geometrically aware components or constraints that improve the performance of these networks. What do I mean by this? So what we try to do is to explore data representations that, are, uh, that have high levels of expressivity and help the network to train faster, for instance. And then we also design a specific layers or modules inside the deep networks uh, that can in somehow reason about the underlying geometry or appearance of the of the problem that we have at hand. So just let me give you an example of what I mean by this with a problem of uh, body pose estimation. So um, this is a work that we presented uh, a few years ago. Um, I don't need to uh, explain again what, what's the problem. So Greg did a very excellent talk on that. So, but basically what we have here are 2D joints that we can extract with our uh, favorite 2D pose estimation method open pose, for instance. And what we want to do is, given these 2D joints, we want to train a network that lifts, lifts these uh, 2D joints to the 3D space, all right? So here, we could just uh, apply a simple regression. So let's imagine that we have a, a large data set of 2D poses and 3D poses, and we train a network for that. But instead, 
of using the 2D and 3D uh, Cartesian coordinates, we came up with a novel representation somehow, uh, which is representing both the 2D uh, joints and the 3D joints using Euclidean distance matrices. So what are these matrices? In this, in 2D, this 2D Euclidean distance matrix, every entry of this matrix is a pairwise distance between two joints in the image space. And in 3D, it's the 3D distance between per, pairs of joints, all right? So what's, what are the advantages of, this, um, of these representations? We can here, uh, since we have a, a two-dimensional representation, we can very well exploit the, 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 the properties of the convolutions, for instance. Also, uh, what another advantage of these representations is that they capture very well the correlations between the different joints, right? So we have uh, pairwise distances and uh, we have a complete uh, 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 knowledge of the relation between, uh, for instance, the, uh, a joint in the hand and a joint in the, on the foot, right? And uh, for that, um, this network in the middle was very simple. You can imagine that if our 3D body has 20 uh, joints, this is a, a, a very small matrix, right? 20 times 2, um, uh, 20 times 20, sorry, and here in the same size. Right, so these um, the input and output are very small matrices, and this can be learned with uh, extremely small uh, um, uh, deep networks. So we use the deep network with only six, 0 0.6 uh, megaparameters. And uh, just let me jump to results. And uh, what I show you here is uh, what we got uh, if, um, uh, in that case, we occluded part of the input image, right? Uh, let's assume that we have these 2D joints detected, all right? And these joints that uh, are on the right part of the, of the arm are occluded. So occluded means that uh, are not seen. And how do we represent this? So we just remove these uh, entries from the input uh, Euclidean distance matrix. So you see that these columns and rows are not seen by the algorithm. And uh, even though uh, we don't know this, uh, then the 3D Euclidean distance matrix is uh, completely predicted. So we hallucinate very well the position of these joints. And as you can see here, this is the, these are three views, the frontal, the side, and the top view of the 3D representation. And you see that the right arm is, not, uh, uh, is quite well estimated, even though it's not seen. And the rest of joints that are seen in 2D, they are also very well estimated in 3D. Some uh, more examples of uh, image in the wild, right? This should be uh, some small short clips. Uh, yes, from the Leeds uh, Spores dataset. Okay, yes, so you can see that even with uh, complex body poses, this algorithm worked pretty well. So more examples here. All right. And um, that's uh, what we obtained with uh, this very simple algorithm. So um, I, I don't uh, give you uh, numerical details, but basically um, uh, this algorithm was uh, uh, a state of the art just for uh, a couple of weeks uh, because uh, at that time, so there was a, a very hard push of uh, algorithms in 3D pocket estimation. And uh, what we uh, obtained it here was rapidly surpassed by other methods. And uh, actually uh, today there are very good methods with very small error. But uh, uh, the idea of using Euclidean distance matrices was still uh, quite novel. So uh, we did a step further on this uh, method. And um, one caveat of uh, the, uh, the methods of 3D pose estimation is that uh, they do not estimate the, the absolute body pose estimation. So we know the 3D body pose, but for instance, we don't know how far this person is from the camera. So in, in an extension of this work, what we did was to compute the absolute 3D body pose estimation. And for this, what we did uh, is to just, uh, this was the initial uh, body pose estimation, uh, which was uh, body centered. So in this uh, network, we don't know how far is the person, the absolute position of the person. And here we just added an absolute pose layer. And this absolute pose layer so what we did here was to exactly implement the, um, the, the geometric equations that compute the absolute pose. So we didn't, we didn't train this with data because this was a, 
a closed form solution and what we did was to put these equations in a differentiable manner in uh, in connection with uh, uh, body centric coordinate estimation so that's what uh, i said that we also try in our group to reason about the geometry and introduce these layers that reason about the geometry uh, inside the deep learning networks so some examples of the uh, of the results on top you see a couple of images where you see the body poses and also the absolute distribution of each one of the persons in the image and uh, while we don't have a run through for this uh, it seems that uh, it's uh, pretty well um, uh, estimated and at the bottom you see the the, the video uh, that um, uh, also the position of the different dancers is very well estimated right all right then uh, this was uh, what i wanted to talk about uh, this uh, topic net if there are no questions here let's uh, jump to the 3d cloth uh, reconstruction we have one question from carla okay let me yes. open the chat what does this plus sign mean between the two matrices plus sign plus sign I don't see a plus sign. Mm -hmm. I don't. Adler, can you can you uh, pose your your question and repeat it? Or which uh, which slide are you talking about in in this slide? Yeah, I think in this slide in the absolute post layer box. There's oh, that's a... that's probably a concatenation. Yeah, that's a a concatenation of the of the input and uh, the what we get from here i right? think actually so. in, in the other one between the matrices right at the top there's the plus sign but i oh that's the pseudo inverse sorry yes yes that's a pseudo inverse you know what the pseudo inverse is right okay great thank you all right so let's move to this other work here uh, again with the definition of the problem uh, we had uh, an input image a single input image of, uh, of a cloth of or a deformable object in general and uh, we wanted to train a network that was able to estimate the 3d shape of just the square patch inside this deformable object so here we had been working on this uh, on the past with more uh, with non deep learning methods and uh, in this non deep learning method the strategy was the following so first in this non deep learning we represented the surface as a mesh we estimated the mesh first we registered the mesh in 2d and then we lift the mesh to 3d using different constraints these constraints are uh, where for instance the isometry a smoothness and projection consistency and we try to emulate this uh, pipeline with a uh, deep network so for that we designed this uh, network right that has different branches and the, uh, each one of the branches emulates a part of the traditional reasoning for instance the branch on the top is the detection branch so we here we have just a regressor that iteratively estimates the to the position of the vertices of the mesh all right we do this uh, using a simple resnet then we have a second branch that takes the estimation of the vertices of the mesh and lifts these vertices to 3d and finally we have a, a, a branch that we called a shape branch that tries to enforce the reprojection consistency of the 2d and 3d all right and also it performs some procrastus alignment so with this uh, network we could then um, uh, train we, we could train it but we had a problem because uh, uh, in 2000 18 or 17 there were no large data set for that and something that we need to do usually is to create our own data to train the network so here we use a, a rendering network uh, sorry a rendering um, uh, engine maya in that case to generate uh, 120,000 images of the formable objects uh, which uh, these objects were meshes nine times nine meshes with different textures and we changed the deformation by simulating the movement of the cloth uh, with the wind all right and we also changed some properties of the surface like the, the reflectance the, the position of the lights and and the materials so with that uh, large data, with this large data set we could uh, then train 
uh, our network and these are some of the examples that we obtained so uh, we evaluated on different conditions so in the case that known texture means that this texture was seen uh, in in train not the the 3d configuration but uh, but uh, the the texture we also uh, evaluated on evaluated on new textures on uh, uh, the formable objects with no texture at all and also we simulated occlusions all right and uh, here you can see the results so on the top uh, it's a frontal view of the 3d representation and on the side the ground truth and the estimated and you can see that for instance in that case even with these uh, hard occlusions we could kind of estimate the complex uh, 3d geometry all right and uh, here we compared with other methods uh, the first uh, five methods are non deep learning methods, all right? And then um, we kind of improved them, not that much, but uh, the, the most important is that then um, uh, at inference time, we could, uh, inf uh, we could get the 3D about 100 times faster. And also here, what's interesting is that we evaluated our method with a simple ResNet. So instead of reasoning with the different uh, branches that I mentioned, we just took a network, uh, a ResNet that uh, tried to infer the 3D coordinates of the vertices from, uh, from the 2D image. And this, we call it brute force solution, did not work at all. So it completely failed. So it means that introducing the reasoning, the reasoning inside the network did, did, uh, uh, did help. So more examples on... Um, this was the CD lab uh, um, sequence. It was computed the ground truth using a, a Kinect camera, and then we evaluated using just the RGB images. And again, our method uh, was the one that was performing the best. All right. And again, the ResNet, the brute force solution, completely failed. All right. Uh, we have a question. I don't know. Can this be? Oh, it's from the previous. Uh, can the 3D body pose make predictions based on on learned data? Yes, actually, that's what we do. Uh, we learn from, uh, from 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 training data. And then Carla Rodriguez is asking, what did you use to test the success of this method? So for this specific method, so uh, we had this uh, data set that we captured, right? These 120,000 images, and uh, we split these uh, data set in, in training validation and test and we uh, for the test we had exactly the the, the, the ground truth so we could uh, use this data for validation and also this um, this data here from the CV lab they also provided the ground truth and measurements are just the the, the measurements uh, Carla are just the 3d distances the 3d mean distance between the ground truth and uh, our estimation right and actually in this uh, in this uh, slide here the color so uh, it means uh, the, the level of error so the the reddish are uh, um, uh, the, the higher uh, levels of error right okay and let's move to the next uh, work uh, i want to present this is an iccb uh, 19 that uh, uh, it was about modeling the, the whole three clothes of humans uh, and at the same time modeling also the humans all right so the motivation at this point was that um in 2018 19 there were not that many papers that were estimating the clothes of of people and uh, also not that many words that were estimating the body shape so and also uh, one of the problems uh, for applying deep learning is that there was not a large public data set on 3d dressed humans. Uh, Gregory already mentioned this uh, problem in his talk and uh, in 2019 there were no data sets of uh, dressed humans. So the data sets that were available were very small and not sufficient to train the networks. So the contributions of this work were, were threefold. First, we built a large data, uh, scale data set of synthetic uh, images and models of dressed humans. Then we proposed a novel representation for 3D shape, which was, again, appropriate to train deep networks. And finally, we designed a deep network to infer the 3D body and clothes from single images. 
All right, let's uh, first, uh, I want to present this uh, data set. We call it the 3D people data set. Um, uh, we used uh, uh, rendering tools for that. So basically we created a data set with 2 million images, 80 different subjects, 40 male and 40 female, and that they were performing different actions. And we recorded the scenes from different uh, camera views. And also we randomly changed the background, right? To give uh, more variability to the data set. So we provided in this data set multiple cloth uh, textures, the 3D models, also the skeletons, and the normals, depth, and optical flow data. All right, and the cloth labels. So given this large data set, we can then um, uh, tackle different problems. And the one that we want to tackle first was the one on, on, um, on 3D shape reconstruction from single images. So here we had an input image of a dress, uh, person and we wanted to train the network to estimate uh, his or her 3D shape uh, of the body and clothes, all right? So here the first question was, what do we use to represent the 3D shape, right? Do we use a parametric model, a 3D point cloud, voxels, octree? And uh, here I just want to mention that uh, in 2019, the implicit representations that we have seen in NERFs um, today, so the um, there were still not uh, uh, in the state of the art. So they were not still known. So we didn't contemplate this solution. So what we proposed here was uh, uh, a representation of the 3D shape that was based on uh, what is called the geometry image. The geometry image, we didn't invent that. It comes from a, a transaction graphics paper in 2002. And basically that's the same, that's uh, the following. Let's say that we have a 3D mesh, complex 3D mesh of a uh, dress person and uh, what we want to do is to find uh, appropriate representation for this so and we represent this with a 2d uh, domain representation right and how do we transform the 3d mesh to a 2d uh, to the uh, in a 2d domain so we do this uh, with different steps first there is a, a spherical mapping that's an optimization uh, approach that uh, that is done by basically I mean we inflate the 3D mesh of the of the person and project it on a sphere, right? Then this sphere is projected onto a octahedron, and then we cut these sides of the octahedron and unfold it. And when we do that, we can represent this 3D mesh with a, a geometry image. So basically, every point here, right? It's a, a, an x y z position that corresponds to an x y z position of here. But of course, if we represent the shapes using this uh, bi-dimensional um, representation, it's much more appropriate to train a deep network, right? Because then what we have is training images of persons, right, of people. And uh, for each image, we have the corresponding geometry image. For instance, this geometry image here corresponds to this uh, person here, right? And this geometry image encodes the 3D geometry of this person in that specific position. All right. And then uh, for training this, we used um, uh, a network uh, with no much secrets. Uh, we call it a GymNet. It was basically a multi-scale regressor that given input images of uh, persons, we wanted to estimate this geometry image, right? And we did. We did this in a course to find manner, All right? I'll not go into detail with this. Um, just uh, jump to the results. So here uh, we show the input image uh, of different people on different poses, even complex poses, giving this backflip. And uh, you see that we could uh, estimate somehow the 3D geometry of the person. And also something that was very challenging, estimate the geometry of long dresses. So we could also somehow estimate it. Right, and uh, we also evaluated this in real images, and uh, it uh, also performed quite well. All right. Um, if there are no questions, I'll jump uh, to the next uh, paper I want to present. What made you think at first that using? Uh, I think Carla, the, the question is not complete. Well, we, uh, 
what we wanted to find is, uh, um, uh, so as, uh, Carla is asking what might us think that the geometry image could help us. So uh, always if you have a, a two-dimensional representation of your data, uh, you can, uh, in deep learning, you can exploit the convolutional networks, right? So you can exploit the convolutions, you can apply convolutions on this uh, domain, and this is much simpler to train for a network. While if we have this, uh, you, uh, there, there are graph-based uh, networks that we could apply here, but these uh, networks become much more complicated, right? So what we try to do is to, sim uh, to, uh, to get probably, we, we did a lot of work in building these representations. So offline, uh, we had to compute these geometry images. It took a lot of time, but once we had that, uh, uh, training the network was much more simple, all right? All right, then uh, let's move to the next paper I want to present uh, is uh, on cloth uh, generation. So in the previous one that I've presented is, um, uh, is uh, cloth reconstruction. Here we want to generate clothes. So we want to build the generative model that given some input parameters and uh, a network, then it gives you um, 3D geometry of, for instance, that case, um, uh, a t-shirt, right? So there were already in, in the literature in 2021 um, some papers that uh, already did that. But uh, these approaches need to train a specific model for each closed topology. For instance, if we want to uh, build or generate t-shirts, we need to train a network specifically for t-shirts. If we want to do hoodies, so we need to do it specifically for hoodies and so on. So what we presented here was, uh, we call it simplistic, is a generative model that is able to represent multiple clothes topologies. So we can go from uh, t-shirts, uh, uh, short sleeveless uh, shirts, even open jackets and using a single model. So I'll quickly explain how uh, we train this model. So first uh, we have a data set of clothes and uh, of clothes on top of a human body. All right, and what we do first is to uh, represent this occlusion map. Occlusion map is we have a bi-dimensional representation of this uh, of the body, right? Uh, and that's called UV map. And on top of UV map for each cloth, we painted the parts of the cloth that were occluded by uh, uh, the parts of the body that were occluded by this cloth. All right, and we use this representation. This basically it's. Uh, to the representation. And with this, we train it an image encoder to estimate uh, some latent vectors, right? These latent vectors control uh, the area of the occluded clothing and also the uh, variations in geometry for clothes having the same um, occlusion map. On the other hand, we also um, had the 3D points, right? We have 3D points in a space, uh, in a volume of the space, not on top of the person. And uh, for each point, then we represented its, um, uh, its position using an encoding that was the, basically the distance of the point to several uh, specific points on top of the body. So this was a positional encoding. So we had this latent vector here, the position of the three point in space, and then we trained at the network that basically told you um, how far is this point from the, from the from the from the cloth, right? We train the network to predict an unsigned distance field, right? And these are the trainable parameters. So we train the, the parameters of this network. These uh, latent vectors are also trainable, and the parameters of this encoder were also trainable. Once we had this network trained, what we could do was the following: we could basically select. Uh, imagine you have an, a slider; you can select. Uh, the latent vectors that represent the cat, another one that represents the style, and also uh, another slider that defines the parameters uh, of the body. So if uh, the person is taller or shorter, uh, fatter or thinner, etc. Right? And we pass this through this training network. And what we do for is for every point in a space, right? Let's say that we take a 3D volume, uh, a three grid in a space. For every point of three degree, we predict the distance of this point with respect to the dressed uh, person, right? 
And once we have this, we apply an algorithm that's called Martian cubes that computes the three dimension out of this um, distance field representation. After this, we can also apply another uh, network to repose the, 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 the estimated geometry of the person. All right, and uh, that's our generative, generative model. We can, once we have the generative model, we can apply it to different problems. The first problem, uh, well here, sorry, first uh, an example of what we obtained with this uh, generative model. So uh, imagine by changing this vector, I think it was an eight-dimensional vector. By moving across this vector, we could change the what is called the, the, the cat, right? You see how this changes, the length, uh, the width. Here, changing this uh, other latent vector, we could change um, the different um, styles. And also, we could uh, uh, change uh, the, the body shape. All right. Then um, we applied this uh, generative model uh, to uh, to reconstruct 3D, uh, uh, 3D persons and clothes. So for doing this, uh, given an input image, all right, we first segmented it using an off-the-shelf algorithm uh, to segment the different clothes. And basically, what we did was to uh, optimize the latent vectors to fit this, um, such that the projection of the of the three clothes fit this uh, segmentation here. And with this, we could obtain the, the 3D reconstruction plus uh, the different uh, different clothes of the person, all right? So we had a 3D layered clothing. So let me just show you some examples here of what we obtained, all right? Even for relatively complex body poses, we had um, reconstructions of the body plus uh, um, each one of the clothes that the person was wearing. So the, the shoes, the pants, or the upper, upper clothes, upper body clothes. More examples here. All right. So, uh, yes, more. And uh, what I want to show you at the end is that since we have this generative model, another possible application is to do cloth editing, all right? Because uh, we have the 3D reconstruction of each one of the clothes, and then we also can change the, the latent vectors and uh, the, the, the clothing, and we can do virtual try on, on 3D. So here what we did basically was given an input image, we obtained the 3D layer clothing, and then we changed the latent vectors to, for instance, in that case, uh, remove the jacket and, and add some sandals or some shorts here. And here we remove the sandals and we put some boots, right? And uh, we changed the the, the, the t-shirt by uh, a hoodie. All right. Um, I have a question regarding this slide that um, how do you transform like uh, the image to reconstruct the model of the person in 3D? 3D? Can, can, can you, can you, uh, yes, please? you take this image and then reconstruct the model of the person in 3D? Like, yes. How do you use or... So what we do is uh, what uh, I try to explain here, right? So let's say that we have this uh, input image and we want to do the 3D reconstruction. Right. So first, what we do is to apply a, a cloth segmentation. So we split these images, this image in different regions, and the different regions represent the hair, the face, the the, the upper body clothes, and the lower body clothes. Right. We also apply another algorithm to estimate the body shape. Uh, that's the Fram mockup. So these are off-the-shelf algorithms. And then what we do is uh, uh, our uh, generative model by changing the latent vectors. Right. Imagine that you can slide the latent vectors, and for each uh, configuration of latent vector, you can project on top of the image. So we find the latent vector that best projects on top of the image, right? So uh, we change the latent vector of the upper body to fit this, uh, this uh, region of the upper body uh, segmentation, right? And by optimizing uh, the three latent vectors uh, uh, simultaneously, 
we can then do this reconstruction at the same time we obtain the reconstruction independently for each one of the clovers. Yeah, was this more or less clear? Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. And then, for example, uh, so you can know the measurements of, for example, the, the hip of a person, like by, for example, if you want to test, like, if a cloth would fit into a person. Yes, like... the, well, uh, at, at some point, because this depends a lot on the, on the accuracy of this algorithm here in the, in the center, so the frame cup. And uh, while these, uh, usually they estimate very well what is the pose of the person, the shape of the person is harder, right? And actually, um, I will not present it today, but we have done uh, um, following words that uh, try to estimate better the shape of the person. But if we, have, if we do have a good shape of the person here in this estimator here, uh, then we can do what you say. Oh, okay. Thank you. Two more questions, then... Francesc, from Mario and from Pablo. And now from there... Can you share some applications, a scenario wherein you uh, you apply this research output? Well, uh, for instance, uh, mm, this could be applied for um, virtual trion, right? So now uh, it's very trending, uh, the virtual trion, many of the or I would say 99.9% .9 of the algorithms on virtual trion are on 2D. So basically you have an input image and you swap uh, clothes. So here we could do this in 3D. And imagine that you can um, you can uh, do your virtual trion in 3D. You can just rotate and see how the, the clothes look from the back. This could be a, really a, a, punch, a potentially application for that. And then what is the algorithm you're using to generate the cloth uh, mesh? The cloth mesh? Oh, that's marching cubes. So I guess that you mean uh, this algorithm for, um, for going from this distance field representation to this uh, mesh representation. That's marching cubes. So that's uh, also an algorithm that's very uh, common today. And uh, if you just Google this uh, algorithm, you'll find how to, uh, how to do that. All right. All right. Thank you. So let's uh, move to the next one. Now, so uh, as I said, now uh, we were in 3D. Uh, we were trying to generate images, um, generate clothes in 3D. <clears throat> but now uh, we will move to the 2D realm. So to the uh, appearance, appearance representation. So here, that's um, an old world that we presented in, in, at CDPR 18. And basically the problem was the, the following. Uh, we were given an input image of a person and um, his or her pose of the body, right? Presented by the skeleton, the pose was in 2D. And uh, the goal here <clears throat> was to synthesize novel uh, and photo, photorealistic images of the same person from different viewpoints and different uh, uh, body poses, right? So um, here you can see different examples, right? Um, uh, even uh, we were we wanted to be able to represent the person uh, as he or she would see would be seen from the back, uh, while we only had one uh, frontal image. So the main contribution of this work that. Um, uh, in contrast to previous approaches, we didn't want to use full supervision. What do I mean by this? So previous work, they had, uh, they used, um, they leveraged on a large data set of uh, images of the same person from different viewpoints, all right? So they had, for instance, this go from the, wearing this, uh, this outfit from, uh, they had images from the side, from the, from the, uh, from the front, from the back, etc. So we didn't want to use this. So this, of course, then helps uh, a lot. You can get much more data uh, from the internet uh, if you don't use this kind of constraint. But at the same time, it makes the problem much more complicated. But uh, for solving this, then uh, we built this uh, network. At first sight, it may, it may look a bit cumbersome, right? but uh, I'll try to explain it uh, in a bit of detail. So basically what we had here, uh, was uh, that given an input image, we wanted to train this network G that provides uh, the uh, same image of the same person from a different pose, this pose here, that's the side pose, right? But uh, we had to do this uh, step by step. 
So first, if we only had this generator and we, don't, we didn't use any other kind of constraint, we would just uh, get pure noise, right? If we wanted to force the generator to produce photorealistic images, we used the uh, discriminator, right? We, we exploited the discriminator that was used at the time from PatchGAN, right? And what we had now is just the input image. We pass this uh, generator and we produce a photorealistic image, but not, uh, but even, but now uh, it doesn't have the same identity of them, of the same uh, person, and the pose is not correct. <clears throat> To enforce the pose, we added another component, which is this pose constraint here. So a different uh, layer that estimated the pose and computed the laws that enforced the, the pose to be correct. Now the pose is correct, but the identity is not, right? So observe that if we had fully supervision here, if we knew how this go looks from this pose, now we could add a loss here and train this network. But we do not have that. What we did instead was a, a trick a very simple trick that was called the cycle consistency. Basically, what we did is to apply the same generator, but trying to recover the original image. So we conditioned this second generator with the initial post, and we tried to recover the initial uh, image, right? And now we could apply this cycle consistency to train everything together. All right. and. Um, with no further details, just let me show you some examples. So um, this is the input event in the first column, the 2D pose, uh, and the estimation that we got, and uh, the ground truth. And you can see that even in situations <coughs> where uh, we had the input event in frontal position and the, um, uh, the desired pose in the back, so the estimation was quite, quite good. But of course, um, uh, we didn't have that much um, uh, supervision here, so we also, when you apply this kind of uh, GANs, uh, if you don't add uh, um, that much supervision, you can have also nice, well, nice, uh, scary examples like this uh, Frankenstein's here, that we had some failure cases with people with two heads or um, of two hands, uh, etc. or in that case, that uh, the, the pens here were um, uh, estimated or uh, propagated as boots in the uh, estimation and not as the, the whole bench. But in any case, it was a good step forward to the problem because we, the kind of supervision that we used uh, was much more smaller than the previous methods. All right. And um, based on the same methodology, I'll explain the next paper. This is on phase animation, all right? So it's, uh, methodolo methodologically, it's very similar to the previous one. So here, the idea was the following. We were given an input image of a person. This is Albert, the first author of uh, that paper. And uh, we wanted to generate synthetic images of Albert um, uh, with different experiences, angry, scared, happy, and surprised. So this was already done in the state of the art. So this transition of one input image to, uh, let's say, a discrete number of expression was already solved. But uh, the main contribution of our, our work was that we could do this smoothly. We could smoothly transition between the different expressions. I know if it's observed in the video, I hope so, that we could uh, smoothly change from one expression to the other. <clears throat> and how did we do that? Uh, basically, two main components. Um, as I said before, the representation is very important. So here we represented the expressions using what is called action units. Action unit basically it's um, uh, every uh, expression is represented as a, a combination of different action unit and every action unit uh, <coughs> represents the motion of, of a specific uh, facial muscles. For instance, the uh, action unit 45 represents the movement of the eye lights or the, this one here, the, the forehead, etc. And now a given expression can be just represented as a linear combination of the activation of the level of activation of each one of these uh, action units. So the second contribution was uh, uh, um, a self-learned uh, phase tension model. And uh, what do I mean by this? So let's say that we have this input image of a person in neutral expression, and we want to generate this kind of a smiley face. Right, 
So observe that most of the pixels of the input image remain the same in the, in the generated image. So we forced our network to learn which areas of the face are important to generate the new, uh, new uh, expression, right? And we split our generator into this uh, uh, attention layer and also this, uh, I would say, it's like a delta of the RGB in such a way that this uh, output expression is, uh, co is computed as a linear combination of this input image and this attention uh, layer and uh, this del delta RGB, all right? With these two main components, uh, we had uh, this network, Ganymation, it's called, that at test uh, it looks like this. We have the original image, a vector of, uh, I think, 25 elements that represents the, um, the desired expression, all right? And we pass this through this generator that uh, computes the, 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 the attention plus the delta RGB, and then we combine this and we compute the estimated image. This is a test. A train, uh, well, again, here, uh, as in the previous work, uh, we wanted to train this in a weekly supervised manner, so we didn't want to use full supervision. And in our training data set, we didn't have the same person uh, from uh, with different expressions. So to train this, uh, we uh, we did something very similar as before. So I'll now go quickly here. First, we have a generator that uh, if we do not add any other constraint, uh, initially just generates noise. We force uh, photorealism with a discriminator then we force uh, also the expression to be uh, the correct one using an expression constraint regressor, all right? And uh, we force the identity using the cycle consistency trick, right? And I'll skip the details because are basically the same as before. And uh, at the end, what we have is um, these um, uh, input images, our, um, the vectors of uh, desired expressions, and when and we can generate uh, the, the new the new uh, expression of the person, all right? And uh, the cool thing of uh, this representation is that we could smoothly transition between the input image and the generated image. So if we basically, this desired expression, we, uh, we linearly inter interpolate between the input expression and the desired expression, we can smoothly transition between the, the input and the output and the desired, sorry, uh, in, a kind, in a very realistic manner. So if we put these images in a video, in short videos, you will see that the transition is actually very, very realistic. Even in that case, in the first case, you see that how the teeth appear when the person uh, smiles, right? So here, uh, I guess you know this guy, most of you. So we also could change his expression. He, he didn't used to smile, but in that case, we made him a smile. And uh, in that case, that's a frame of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, and you see how we can smoothly change the expression of each one of the characters, right? And uh, what's uh, important from this example is that you see that the that when we when changing the expression, so uh, the there uh, and there are no uh, transition abrupt transitions in the image, and that's because of we, we use this attention model. So the attention model allows to glue very well the new expression on top of the original image. All right, uh, how are we in time? We have 10 more minutes. Uh, okay, um, if there are no questions here, I'll go to, uh, we move again to the 3D realm and uh, I will want to talk quickly about this work on 3D head reconstruction. So here, that's work that we presented at last uh, ICCB. All right, and basically what we had uh, is uh, uh, from uh, three input images, we wanted to build uh, models of the full 3D head. So there were some works that were doing this for faces, for the facial area, but uh, for the full head, there were no works. And uh, we based on these um, new algorithms that are called uh, implicit representations, and in particular, we use this implicit differentiable rendering. So that's uh, NeoRibs 2020 by Yarif Tal, that basically uh, they train a network, right? That um, let's say that given uh, a camera position and different points on top of the ray, they estimate the SDF, which is the signed 
distance function of every point with respect to the surface, all right? So they train a network to do that. And the supervision is done in such a way that they attach these to a differentiable rendering network, right? That once they have the SDF, they produce the uh, output image, right? And they compare it with the input image and the training is just done using the, the input images, all right? Uh, Albert Pumarola, the next speaker, uh, will talk a lot about uh, rendering networks and differentiable rendering. So I'll just skip the details. But the main message here was that um, this work here had some limitations in the, in the sense that it required a lot of input images and it was quite slow. But in our case, since this work was done in, um, in a company that, uh, that had a large data set of uh, 3D heads, uh, what we did was to take advantage of this and build a prior on this geometry network, right? A prior that again was controlled by a latent vector. So this company that um, I'm talking about is Chrysalix, right? They have uh, like uh, 10,000 complete scans. So uh, from these scans, we built the prior. Basically, uh, the part of the geometry network, uh, we trained this prior such that it could be controlled by means of a latent vector. So basically what I mean by this is the following. Uh, we train the, this, uh, this prior such that then uh, with a latent vector of a um, few dimensions, uh, I think it's 128 or 64, we then can produce uh, 3D shapes of, uh, of full heads. And if we just interpolate between, the, between these latent vectors, you see that we can smoothly transition between the different uh, 3D models. So basically we did that. So we uh, substituted the geometry network by this prior uh, aided network, right? Uh, and uh, with this, we uh, speed up a lot the training procedure and also obtained much uh, accurate results. So just let me jump to the results here. Just I'll skip that just to, to show you that this slide probably is the one that best represents the, the comparison against a method that doesn't use the prior. So here uh, in this row here, you can see the original uh, differential, uh, implicit differential, differentiable render uh, method that doesn't use the prior. Uh, the estimations that uh, it gets using three views, four views, eight, 16, and 32. And you see that uh, with two, uh, three views, the, the, the error is quite large, while our method here with three views, observe here, with three views, we could already obtain a very good estimation of the, of the 3D geometry, all right? And in that case, uh, even the, the difference is much more clear. So IDR, I would say it fails completely with three views, but uh, uh, in our case, with three views, we already obtained very good estimation because of the prior. All right, and uh, just uh, some examples of the results we got. Uh, uh, it worked quite well on images in the wild. We didn't have to, uh, to have um, constrained acquisition uh, uh, capture systems. So, okay. So now let me go very quickly to explain this uh, last paper. I have like four or five minutes. Uh, and uh, this is on grass performance. Uh, again, this was, work was done in collaboration with uh, Greg and the student that uh, did the internship at Navarro Labs. So, and that was a CDPR a couple of years ago. The problem here was the following. Uh, Actually, we define a kind of new problem. So this, was, this problem was not uh, used before in, in, in hand modeling. Um, given a, an input image uh, of, with one or several objects, what we wanted to do, our goal, was to predict how a human would grasp each one of the objects, all right? And uh, as a side result, we also obtained a 3D reconstruction of the, of the object. Why this may be useful, then um, some applications uh, uh, very immediate are the prosthetic design, human-robot interaction, um, BR and AR applications. So uh, again, here we found that the first thing that we had to do, unfortunately, was to create a data set. There was already a data set that was called the YCB affordance data set, um, that uh, this data set is made of 58 household objects, right? 
we had the cut model of every object, but we enrich this data set with uh, grasping um, information. Basically, we manually annotated each one of the objects of the, this data set with different types of grasps um, in uh, 33 grasp taxonomies that already existed. So for instance, we took this screwdriver and we annotated this manually with a medium wrap uh, 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 grasp, right? And this is the precision tripod, distal, and, and different kind of, of grasp. So we, do, we had to do this hard work of uh, annotating the data set uh, for then uh, uh, train the network, right? And here you see the, uh, a video with uh, different types, types of grasp that we annotated. Uh, this was done semi-manually, so we annotated 133,000 images of 21 uh, objects and um, um, with this 33 grasp taxonomy. And at the end, we had like 28 million different grasps. Of course, we didn't have to do this manually for every uh, uh, type of grasp, but we kind of um, designed the semi-automatically method that this was could be actually created in less than a week. All right, and this is the example of the data set. All right, once we have the data set, then we can train our network. So what we want to do is, given an input image, we want to estimate the geometry of the object in the image plus the uh, grasp uh, uh, configuration of the hand. For this, we did with different uh, modules. The first module was a module that estimated the geometry of the scene, right? So we used a pre-trained network for that. Then we had a second branch that estimated a very coarse uh, estimation of the of the grasp, basically uh, using the um, given this input image and the mask, we try to predict the type of grasp. So I told you that we have a 33 grasp taxonomy, so we tried to predict this uh, this grasp uh, taxonomy. And in a second, uh, in a final stage, we refine the parameters that we estimated at the very beginning uh, with uh, with this module here. So here are just some of the losses that we tried to optimize in this refinement. In this refinement we had initially an, an initial pose of the hand and we tried to uh, optimize the, the position of the fingers here. All right, so also we enforced uh, a prior on the contact points. So we said that the contact points of the object and the hand uh, need to be concentrated on the on the fingertips and also this part of the hand. We also um, uh, forced the loss to avoid object hand interpenetration. Another loss to avoid uh, or to minimize the ground hand interpenetration. And finally, that's very important: an adversarial loss that tells you if the hand is um, is uh, realistic or not. If we didn't use this kind of uh, laws, we could end up with non-anthropomorphic hands uh, like this. All right, just I'll jump this one and uh, I'll go uh, directly to the results. So here, these are synthetic results. What I show you in each case is the initial estimation of the hand plus the refinement that we get uh, after the, the second stage. And you see that in some cases, I don't know, this one is not clear. But here, you see that in the initial estimate, so there is some interpretation of the hand and the object. And when we apply the refinement, this inter interpretation is just removed. All right, so we have also some real uh, examples here. This should be a video as well with different objects, etc. All right, it's 12.15. I need uh, I'll very quickly jump to the conclusions. Uh, sorry, I had to speed up at the end. Um, so we have presented different strategies for improving the performance of the networks to model humans. The first strategy, it's, uh, it's uh, hard to do, but uh, it's necessary many times, is building your own data set because uh, sometimes data doesn't exist for the problem that you want to tackle. The second uh, is more scientifically interesting is the exploiting the rich data representation. So I've shown you examples of Euclidean distance matrices, geometry images, distance fields, or action units for different problems. And finally, we have presented different architectures that uh, 
uh, in somehow reason about the, the geometry or appearance of the problem. And uh, that's, well, some extensions of the work, but I'll show this. What's important is that the people that have done this, uh, these works. So Alberto Marola, the first author in a lot of works, and Rick Coron as well, and Gregory the, the, uh, that uh, gave an excellent talk before, Alberto as well. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Frances. You have here uh, the last question by Pablo. Did you join the grasping models with robot manipulators? Yes, that's actually a very good question. And uh, we did it in a, in a following work uh, that um, we applied the same methodology to predict uh, uh, grasp for robotic reapers. Uh, actually, if uh, you want to go to my webpage, you'll see an ICRA. Uh, 2021 that was based on this methodology, but for uh, robotic hands. Okay. Any other question? Yeah, well, the web page, if you go to the link of the presentation, then uh, there is a link to the web page, and this link then uh, drives you to, the, to my personal web page. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesc. Thank, thank you. you.